one of the most exciting series that I can remember. I mean, I, I love to teach God's Word. Uh, I love to be up front and share that with you. But this one really strikes very much at the heart of what Carol Ann and I have done throughout our ministry career. One God, one mission. What God wants to do in us, and then after we've allowed Him to work in us, what He wants to do through us together in living out His mission. So it was three weeks ago we began this teaching series. I shared with you from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 1. Book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles. It's a first-hand account by Dr. Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, um, telling us how the early believers, how the early church lived out their faith. It describes in incredible detail the message, the ministry, the, the source of power that enabled and drove the early church to do what God was calling it to do. It's been said that any follower of Jesus who really wants to know how to be a disciple of Jesus needs to read the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts has several very significant themes, but there's probably two main themes that start at the beginning and and, and end the book of Acts And they concern the power of the Holy Spirit that was given in the book of Acts that we have recorded. And then that power demanding the necessity that we witness to this person called Jesus Christ. It's why the book has also been called Acts of the Holy Spirit because you can't read the book of Acts without seeing the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of those early believers. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that the church could actually be the witness that God had called it to be. And so it's through the Holy Spirit that we allow him to reign supreme in our area, in every area of our life, to be able to live out the kingdom of God as God has called us to do. Being filled with that spirit means for you and for me to make sure that everything we have and everything that we are is brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's an incredible opportunity. It's an incredible privilege. It's an incredible book. So... The question becomes, if that in fact is true, what is there in our lives, in your life and mine? What is there in the life of our church that still needs to come under the rule and the reign of Jesus? Asking ourselves the question, how much of our life is actually totally and fully surrendered to Jesus? And then where do we need the Spirit to work in us and to work through us? so that we can bring honor and glory to him. Now, it was week one, week two of our teaching. Pastor Steve, our youth pastor, did an awesome job. He shared with us about the restoration of the brokenness of our hearts. And he used two scripture accounts. One, Genesis chapter 11, Tower of Babel, where language was disrupted. No one could really understand each other. Marrying that with the redemption found in Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit was literally poured out into those early believers And now everyone could understand in their own language the good news of Jesus. See, God's mission in this world is to put back together the pieces of a broken creation, righting the wrongs caused by our choosing to separate ourselves from God caused by sin. And so personally, God wants to heal the brokenness in all of our lives. And taking that all the way globally, God's mission is to produce unity in the midst of all of the diversity and sin in the world. In other words, redeeming the world to his honor and to his glory. Last Sunday was an incredible Sunday again as our special guest, Dr. John Wright, who had just returned from three years working in the United Arab Emirates. He took us one step further. He shared with us the cost of living as resident aliens. And the Apostle Peter said, that's who you and I are. In the world in which we live, we are resident aliens, kind of one foot here on earth, one foot in heaven. As he talked about resident aliens, it reminded me of that old hymn. Some of you are familiar with it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Dr. John talked to us about the importance of believing the right thing. If we're going to be a witness to the power of God in our lives, we need to believe the right things. And he just took us very quickly through this theology that started, started with creation. 
that every man and woman, every child, every human being is made in the image of God. That's where it starts. We are created in his image. And then the fact that we chose to separate ourselves from that God in our fallenness and in our sin. We are all sinners. And, of course, the Apostle Paul said, and the greatest of all sinners is me. That humble attitude for those of us who follow Jesus. We're made in his image, but we are all sinners. And then to the incarnation where God said, I am going to then become as a human being. I'm going to leave the splendor of heaven. I'm going to come to earth. And, of course, it's also our own personal incarnation of living out Jesus amongst those who are our friends and neighbors and people around the world. And it's only then, he said, as we start with creation, go to the fall, go to the incarnation, it's then that we begin to share the redemption story. It's then that we've earned the right to share. We don't start there. It comes after we recognize Jesus' life, death, resurrection, It is the good news unto salvation. And then he ended, of course, with glorification, the fact that someday we're going to stand before God. All tribes and all nations will stand before him, praising and giving him honor. It's been a great series. Power of witness, the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to be his witness around the world. It's the good news, and it's one mission and one God. That then brings us to this morning. A couple of weeks ago, our memory verse was Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And so I want us to read it together this morning. So I'm going to invite you to change your position. Stand with me. And together we're going to read that. You see the words on the screen. So stand with me if you're able this morning. And we're going to read together Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Say this with me. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. You may be seated. We know that each of the four Gospels, first part of our New Testaments in our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each have a version of the Great Commission which Jesus gave to his disciples. He gave those between the resurrection and his ascension. It was incredibly important to Jesus to share this. And I would suggest if it was that important to him, it needs to be important to you and to me. Because it is all about Jesus. It's about his life, his death on a cross, his resurrection. And for you and I, if our witness to that fact is going to be effective... It has to come. It's imperative that it comes out of our first-hand personal experience of the risen Jesus. We have to know him before we can witness about what he is doing in us and through us. In fact, we must be of one accord, simply as the early apostles were, who said this in Acts chapter 4, verse 20. We simply cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard about this man called Jesus. Do you have that compunction within you that says, I, I can't stop talking about what Jesus has done for me? Well, Jesus, of course, puts it all together in all of the Gospels, but Matthew 28, 19 is one that we're very familiar with. He said, therefore, after all is said and done, Go. And make disciples of all the nations to the ends of the earth. And you see it in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He said, go to Jerusalem. Of course, the early disciples were a little annoyed with that. But that's that's where Jesus was crucified. They, They hate him there. Why would we go there? But he wasn't done. He said, you have to go through Judea, like through this whole Jewish area. He said, but we've been rejected there. They don't want it. And Jesus said, but that's where you need to go. And then, of course, this was almost going too far. He said, you have to go to Samaria. Dr. John last week did an incredible job of outlining how Jesus prepared the disciples over time, not all at once, but over time, preparing them to what it was going to mean to minister to those Samaritans. So often in his teaching and in his parables, who did he make a hero of his stories? It was a Samaritan. He was preparing them. There was going to come a time. When all people needed to hear the good news of Jesus. Then, of course, he said to the ends of the earth, which we understand today as being to the Gentile world. 
So that's where we're going to pick up the story today. So if you have your Bibles with you, take them out. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Uh, If you have them digitally, turn those on at this point. We do have Bibles in the chairs uh, in front of you on little racks. You can pull those out. It's page 892. Acts chapter 10. Just kind of hold that open. We're going to spend our morning in Acts chapter 10. As you're looking for that, uh, let me give you just a little bit of context. We're going to pick up this story in Acts chapter 10 by coming back to the Apostle Peter. And how appropriate. It was the Apostle Peter, remember, whom Jesus said of, that it is upon you, Peter, the rock, that I am going to build my church. So it's appropriate that we have this story then coming about something that happened in Peter's life. And it is an amazing story of both God's patience with human beings and with his providence in shaping us, his people. In this case, Peter, but to all of us, to continue the work of Jesus on earth until he comes again. It's always about his one mission. It's one God to the ends of the earth. Maybe a little more context is going to be helpful. Up until now, the early church had struggled with this concept of inclusion. They felt basically that the gospel, the good news, Jesus, was exclusively for the redemption of the Hebrew people. Now, it was in an ever-widening geographical area, So when Jesus said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, there were Jews there. And they said, okay, well, we understand that. And when he said to the ends of the earth, they were basically thinking to wherever the Jews are throughout the earth. Gentiles, you and I this morning, for most of us at least, were never considered worthy of Jesus. And yet that was in God's mind that this good news was for everyone. And so if God was going to change the mind of the church and break through those cultural and religious barriers, he was first going to have to change the mind of its leader. And that's Simon Peter. Now even for God, that was no easy task. Peter was steeped in his Jewish tradition. He understood it. He had grown up with it. We've seen record of that in in his history with Jesus, how difficult it was for Peter to change. And yet while difficult for Peter, and probably difficult for many of us this morning, God knew Peter's heart. That's why he said, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. It's going to take some work, but I'm going to do it. Because he knew Peter's heart. And he knew that once Peter understood what it was that God was asking him to do, who it was that God was asking him to become, then Peter would give it everything he had, like he did with every other part of his life, even to the ends of the earth. Now, the story that we have here in Acts chapter 10 would make, I think, an incredible movie. We could call it the Cornelius Factor. Kind of had that little thriller aspect to it. I mean, it would be an incredible movie. It would be based on a true story. Based on a story that would forever change the world. So I'm going to take this passage, and we're just going to divide it into six scenes and see what God has to say to us this morning. There's actually seven scenes in this whole story. It goes through the first 18 verses of chapter 11, the longest narration in all of the book of Acts. It's almost 66. It is 66 verses that we have. We're going to talk about chapter 10 this morning. We're going to talk about the Cornelius factor, and we're going to divide it into those scenes and just see again what God is saying to us. So if you have your Bibles, uh, it's Acts chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading at verse 1. Cornelius calls for Peter. We're told in Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius. He was a captain of the Italian regiment. We'll just pause there for a moment. Italian regiment, uh, it was very well known in that day. It was made up mostly of soldiers from Rome. But this was a regiment that was known for their valor. They were known for their gallantry. And so we're talking about Cornelius. He was a very significant leader of a significant group of men. The fact that he was with his whole household shows that he had quite, you know, a considerable status. He he wasn't sent off somewhere by himself. They were all together with him. So it was this man that we're talking about. In verse 2 it says, He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generous... Now we're talking about two key factors of this Gentile. We're told, first of all, 
He gave generously to the poor, and he prayed regularly to God. Let me just pause there for a moment. There were Gentiles living in that area who had observed these Jewish people. They had observed Jewish Christians now, followers of Jesus, and they were intrigued by what they saw. Here were men and women willing to sacrifice to follow this man called Jesus. And we're told that Cornelius was one of those. While he didn't fully understand it all, he didn't know who Jesus was. He had heard about this God. He was monotheistic. He was praying to this one God. He might not have known exactly who he was, but he prayed to him. And and he prayed at 3 o'clock, one of the three main times that the Jewish people would pray. And so we're told that he was praying. Look what it says. As he was praying one afternoon, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Now, we see this often in Scripture. Do we not? <laughs> when an angel would come into you, I mean, I think you and I would have that same feeling of terror. And the word is very strong. It says, Cornelius stared at him in terror. He was petrified. But he was able to get out these words. Well, what is it, sir? He asked the angel. To which the angel replied, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. So God, God knows. Whether we profess faith or not, he watches. He knows what we do, if we're doing good, if we're not. And he had seen this in Cornelius. He says to him, now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. Now we'll just pause there for a moment. You need to understand that God has already begun working in Peter's life. We don't know all of the things that have led to this point, but this is a very significant phrase that Dr. Luke gives us. He's staying with Simon the Tanner. You see, for Orthodox Jews in that day, they were forbidden to associate with anyone who dealt with dead animals. You just didn't do it. And yet here, Dr. Luke says, oh, he was staying with Simon a Tanner. Well, what does a Tanner do? He deals with dead animals. He takes off their hide, he cures them, and then you've got some good leather. And yet we're just simply told... Peter was staying with him. Simon the Tanner loved Jesus. And for whatever reason, Peter was saying to himself, well, then I I love him too. And so he was staying with him. The stage is being set slowly. God's been working in the life of Peter over time. And the stage is now being set for what's coming next. It's the same thing, I believe, that God does with you and with me today. You see, we're all unfinished. It's a journey that we have from now until we see Jesus face to face. God wants to continue that work, and he was doing it in Peter, and he wants to do it in you and in me. So as soon as the angel was gone, we're told in verse 7, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and told them what had happened, sent them off to Joppa. Okay, there's the first part. Cornelius calls for Peter. Scene 2 begins at verse 9. Now, just set some context. Peter is coming off quite a personal and spiritual high. If you had read through the chapter before in chapter 9, you'll realize that Peter was uh, on his way through uh, teaching, preaching, and he was in the town of Lydda where he met a man who had been paralyzed for eight years. And we're told that Peter prayed for him and he was instantly healed. Sounds pretty good. People in Joppa had heard about this, and so they called to Peter and said, you know this woman who has been part of our local church, Tabitha, who's also known as Dorcas, she's, you know, helped the poor, she's been kind to people, she's been making clothes for them, and she's passed away. And would you come and comfort and be with the family and with the friends? And so Peter goes. And as he's with her, and she's laying, of course, uh, in the room, and there's people around, the widows, and they're weeping, and they're crying, and, and then Peter says, okay, I need you all to leave. And we're told that Peter's praying, and then he simply looks at Tabitha and says, Tabitha, get up. And she did. And she was raised from the dead. So Peter is on this spiritual high, and he is sensing that God is working in his heart and is working in his life. And so we find him all of a sudden, he's living with Simon the Tanner. And God is once again leading Peter ever so slowly, but into the unknown and into the uncomfortable. 
And we're going to find that throughout our story this morning. God leads not only Peter, but you and I into the unknown, and he leads us into the uncomfortable. So look what it says here in verse 9. It says, the next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. We're just going to pause there for a moment. See, God speaks to us. He spoke to Peter. He speaks to you and me when we are praying. When we're talking to God and then pausing long enough to listen, if we listen, the voice of his spirit will speak to us. And God knew that Peter was now open to listening when he was asking him about something new. And so Peter was praying. And I find it interesting that two things converge here at the same time. Peter was praying and Peter was hungry. So Peter was praying, which means God was going to speak to him. But when you hear what the vision was, it was kind of interesting that his stomach was growling and he was hungry. He was waiting for his dinner. And then this is the vision he saw. He said, the sky opened up and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And in the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptile, and birds. And a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. So here he is, he's hungry, he's starving, but he thought he'd spend some time also praying, and then he sees this vision and this voice that says, here it is, eat. Now, as only Peter could do, he says, no way. (laughs) No, in fact, he might have been thinking, I think maybe God's testing me. And maybe he's just wanting to make sure that I understand all of the Jewish laws that I am supposed to follow. And he says, no, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. No, those laws were basically initially to help separate the Jewish people from the others. People would know these folks are very different from us. Look at the laws that they have followed, even to the point of what they can and cannot eat. But God was about to change that. Not necessarily change the laws for them about what they should eat or not eat, but it had the bigger picture of who it was that ultimately he was supposed to share the good news with. But the voice spoke again, it says, in verse 15. And this is one of the key phrases in all of Acts 10. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Do not call something unclean. Now, God had called them unclean in the past. But you understand, God was about to do a new thing. It's what God has done and continues to do to this day. He will make us uncomfortable. The basics of his story never change, but how they are lived out definitely changes. I can remember when Carol Ann and I were first invited to come to Palmyra Brethren in Christ Church. And basically it was the call to say we've purchased some property, we think we're going to need to relocate, kind of what it's going to take vision-wise and practically to get to something else. For those of you who were here at that time, is this what you expected? Nine years ago, is this what you thought was going to be the result of God's call on Encounter Church. Maybe a bigger question is, was I what you thought? (laughs) I was going to be in leading the church through these changes for Carol Ann and I together. See, God surprises us pretty much every step of the way. Calling us to be obedient. What takes us to the next part of the story. We're going to continue. We'll come back to that. Peter meets now the messenger. So Cornelius, remember, in the first part, had sent these people to come and get Peter to come and share with him the message. So Peter, of course, was perplexed by this vision. Uh, He was a thinker. He said, what could this vision mean? And it was just then, as he's kind of thinking this, man, this is the strangest vision I've had in a while. The men who had been sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. And standing outside the gate, they asked, does Simon Peter stay here? And they said, yes. And As Peter was puzzling over this, the Holy Spirit said to him, there's men coming to look for you, three of them. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry. I'm the one who sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, well, we're sent by Cornelius. He's a devout, God-fearing man, well-respected. Holy angel said that he was supposed to summon you to his house so you could hear the message. Peter invited them in. 
See, while the Holy Spirit was the one speaking, Peter was receptive. Peter was open. God knew that Peter was open to being obedient. He sometimes had to think it through, but when he got to that point, God knew that he would be obedient. And I'm here to tell you this morning that when you and I are open to being obedient, it makes us open to change. Very few of us, myself included, who just like change for the sake of change. But in God's economy, when you and I are open to being obedient, we are open to change. Remember, back to Peter staying with Simon the Tanner. We know already that Peter had left his comfort zone. He was ready for whatever God's agenda would be. Even to the point of hospitality, Peter invited the men where? Into that house. These were Gentiles. Invited them into his house and stay the night and be hospitable to them and feed them. Spend time with them. I would suggest to you that hospitality, just kind of as an aside, is an incredible virtue for a follower of Jesus and an incredible witness to the power of God's work. Well, it takes us to scene four. So Peter's going to go now. He's going to visit Cornelius. And I find it interesting in the very first verse there where it talks about in uh, verse 23, the next day he went with him, but he didn't go alone. It says he was accompanied by some of the brothers from Job, some of his fellow believers. He said, I'm not going to do this alone, man. This is, this is weird. This is strange. I'm, I know I'm supposed to go, but I'm going to bring some others with me so that they can also witness what it is that God is doing. And so that's what happened. It was about a couple of days' journey. It says here, that you know, they arrived in Caesarea the following day. So it was at least a couple of days on the road. And I'm sure during that time, Peter was continuing to think through what? He doesn't have the whole picture yet. He's just being obedient. He's open to change. He's going with these Gentiles. They're going on this couple of day trip and they're gonna head back to Caesarea where this Gentile army captain is, Cornelius. You see, these divine promptings from God God's Spirit speaking to you and to me, speaking to Peter. Divine promptings require a human response. How many times must it grieve the heart of God when his Spirit prompts one of his followers and we don't respond? we dismiss. That's not for me. That's too hard. That's too difficult. That's too, wow, that's, that's too big a change. God's speaking all the time. God's at work all the time. We experience God at work all the time. But how many times do we not respond? Peter responded. That divine prompting would have died right there on the table if he had not said yes to God. So it says they arrived there. Cornelius was waiting for them. Called together all of his relatives. So he kind of knew Peter was coming. He knew that it wasn't going to take very long. So all of his family, all of his friends, they were all there waiting. It's interesting, in verse 25, Peter entered his home. Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But immediately, I mean, and, and basically Cornelius was giving honor to Peter. This was the one that his vision, you know, he assumed God was speaking to him. This was, this was a man to be honored. And so he, you know, bowed down before him. Of course, Peter, in his humbleness now, said, no, it's not about me. So, you, you know, get up. Get up. They talked for a while. They went inside. Probably had some food together. Again, this is now Peter and some of his fellow Jewish brothers in Christ in this Gentile home enjoying a meal together. And then finally Peter says, okay, Cornelius, I kind of heard what it was you wanted me to do, but tell me in your own words. Why did you invite me here? And so Cornelius shared that. And then Peter shared these words with him. He said, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this. You know that it's against our laws to associate with you. 
And listen to this. But God has shown me that I no longer should think of anyone as impure or unclean. Bingo. The vision that Peter had on the rooftop had now become crystal clear. He got it. He said, God, God has shown me. No one is impure. No one is unclean. And so that's what he says, without objection, I came as soon as I was sent for. Wow. I mean, that verse 28 is key. The typical Jewish distinctions between people groups, which they had lived with for millenniums, are no longer valid. Peter understood that through Jesus, all of that had now been rendered void. Peter's come a long ways as the leader of the church, and so when God said go, he went. So starting in verse 34, we have the story of the Gentiles hearing the good news. I'm just going to read a portion of this. It says in verse 34, then Peter replied, I see very clearly, listen to this, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ. And then here's the huge phrase at the end of verse 36, who is Lord of all. Not Lord of the Jews. Lord of all. Lord of you. Lord of me. Jesus Christ shows no favoritism of anyone, any people group, any economic status. At the foot of the cross, you and I are equal before God. And then he shares the story of Jesus with them. And actually, this is the only place in the whole book of Acts where we see the full ministry of Jesus outlined. Peter in Acts 2 talked a little bit about it, but here, Peter outlines in incredibly succinct fashion the ministry of Jesus. And then it comes at the end in verse 43, and he says, he is the one, Jesus, of all the prophets testified about. He's the one. And then he says these words again, saying that everyone, everyone who believes in him, in Jesus, will have their sins forgiven through his name. Jesus is Lord of all, and he is for everyone. Everyone who believes. Scene six, the last one that we're going to talk about, this is in verse 44, the Gentiles now receive the Holy Spirit. And this is also fascinating. We're told that even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. It says the Jewish believers were, <laughs> who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. And they knew it because they were speaking in languages that were different than their own. Friends, God's agenda is often so different from what we expect. His agenda surprises us. As you read through the book of Acts, this is the first time that the Holy Spirit was given before a person was baptized. This is the first time that the Holy Spirit or that the apostles had not laid their hands on these people who said they believed before they received the Holy Spirit, before they were baptized. They'd never seen anything like this. Again, God was taking away all barriers, all paradise, saying, this is just who I am, this is what I am about, and I will do things that you don't expect if you're open to it. If you're willing to be obedient, then you need to be open to change because what I am doing is a new thing. And I think as Peter was sharing these words and as he was seeing what was happening, I think he was as amazed by what he was saying and what he was experiencing as anybody in the room. Because it wasn't him speaking, it was God's Spirit speaking in and through Peter, sharing the good news of Jesus is now for everyone and for all people. God is consistent with what he wants to accomplish, but how he does it 
is often in new and exciting and creative ways. And it's what he wants us to be open to. And while it's been a journey for us at Encounter Church, you know, for us to be in this room today, you know, is a testament to the fact that we've not only listened to God's spirit, but we've been obedient and open to change. And not everyone, not everyone has come along for the whole journey. But this is the journey that God has called us to as a church. And we're kind of on the brink now of, of what's next. We're in. Kind of had a big exclamation point on June 10th when we dedicated this whole building to the honor and to the glory of God. Some of the exciting questions that are coming up for us. And where is God taking us as a church? We are to trust him for today. But we also understand that as he works, he often works in ways that do not look the same. God is the same, but how he works and moves is according to his spirit, and we have to be open. So as we conclude, let me ask, what does this passage then have to say to us today? What does it have to say to us here this morning? We're in Palmyra, Pennsylvania, Lebanon County. What does Acts chapter 10 have to say to Encounter Church? I mean, literally speaking, Acts 10 is about Gentiles being given the opportunity to know Jesus without converting to Judaism. Most of us in this room this morning are Gentiles, so we're here because it worked. We're here because we know that Jesus is for us. So how does it apply? Well, first I think the principle found in verse 34 God shows no favoritism is universal. The fact that God shows no favoritism is needed, I think, today more than ever before in our country and around the world. Peter was willing to admit that he had prejudices, huge prejudices. And yet because of his willingness to be obedient to God, he confessed he said, there's certain things I'm doing, I, I, I have to stop. And he did. And in fact, after this, both Peter and the Apostle Paul began to help everybody understand that their identity was not based on their social or human distinctions. That their identity was and always has been in the person of Jesus Christ. We are created in the image of God. That's why our theology starts in Genesis chapter 1. We are created in the image of God. As followers of Jesus, our security, our acceptance comes from only one place, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. We are equal. Every one of us this morning, equal before Jesus. The ground is level, we say so often, at the foot of the cross. God has called us to be a witness to the ends of the earth to every single person on planet earth, to call all people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Jesus said, I've come to minister to the widows, to the orphans, and to the aliens. Aliens. Carol Ann and I, for 20 years, were registered aliens. Same word means we're not from here. Immigrants. Jesus said that should be our mission to those who are the least of these. For the early church, it meant the good news of Jesus sharing those who were most, they were most estranged from. They were told they now had to go to Gentiles and share with them, you don't have to become Jewish. You don't have to follow our laws. You simply have to follow Jesus. It's one mission given to us by one God. So maybe a better question for you and I this morning is who are the Gentiles in our life? Who are the Gentiles for Encounter Church? Who, who are those most not like us? 
who are those for us who are not from here? It's a good question. For some of us, to the ends of the earth might mean that you have to cross the street and show love and hospitality to that neighbor who's just a tad ornery. Maybe for some of us, our Gentiles are going to mean going on a short-term mission trip with one of our mission partners and see where God is at work around the world. For some, you're going to sign up for Impact Pomeroy. That's going to be part of your reaching out to the Gentiles. For some, as we've heard this morning, you're going to pack a box or 10 for Operation Christmas Child. And it is my prayer that for some of us it will mean answering God's call to actually go and serve Jesus in full-time ministry. Whatever it will be for you, know that at times it's going to be very uncomfortable. It just is. Like Peter, God will take you out of your comfort zone if you say yes. And you're going to have to trust him. Like Peter, you're going to have to spend time with God in prayer. You're going to have to ask him for direction. You have to then be silent and listen because he will speak. But when he speaks, you will have to be obedient. You will have to make a choice to follow him. And that often will be uncomfortable And you'll need to be open to change. As I mentioned at the beginning, and as Pastor Amanda said, from this past Friday through tomorrow, the General Assembly of the Brethren of Christ Church are meeting. And that's one of the things that we're grappling with as a denomination. What is our next 10 years going to look like? In 2028, it's going to be the 250th anniversary of the Brethren in Christ Church. So what do we want to look like in 10 years? And so we've been asking some really good questions at the conference that if I can paraphrase them somewhat, I believe they're as applicable to us today individually as an encounter church as it is to our denominations. It's questions and even suggestions that might be helpful. It it might initiate some reflection on our part, initiate some conversation on our part. First of all, we were talking about let's just read the book of Acts. That's what we've been doing at Encounter Church, reading the book of Acts. Make notes. What's the story like of that early church? What were they doing? It's not that we duplicate what they were doing, but what are some of the things principle-wise that what they did we need to do? Reading the story of the early church, what does it tell us about God's mission in the world? What is, what is, what is there to learn about cultural barriers that need to be broken, barriers that hinder God's mission? Or what ways do you see God at work in our church? Where do you see God at work in our community, our country, our world And what might God be saying to you and to us as a church how we need to join in what God is doing? Or even in our community. Who are the people that we're not yet reaching? And how should we, how can we reach them? One God and one mission. You don't want to miss next Sunday. We're going to continue, One God, One Mission. We're going to have Pastor Jay Smith, uh, one of our ministry partners. He's going to come and share about the work that he's been doing in reaching into the Muslim community around the world. As some of you know, Jay and his family have been serving in London, England for the past 25 years in this practice. And just recently, I've moved back to Grantham, Pennsylvania. Jay's going to continue his work with the Board for World Missions on combating Islam around the world. He's an incredible speaker. He was here five years ago in our original building. This time he's going to be sharing with us on how our Brethren in Christ values, which are the values for us here at Encounter Church, how they set us up perfectly to witness to the Islamic community. It's it's going to be an incredible morning. You are not going to want to miss it. Following the service, in fact, we're going to have a luncheon and a QA and a time with Jay uh, in our youth uh, ministries room. Uh, he'll be able to go a little bit more detail with his ministry and also be able to allow you to ask him some questions. And so that's next Sunday. Uh, you want to make sure that you're here for that. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for the stories that we read in your word uh, that allow us to see that at the end of the day, um, we are made in your image and we all struggle with some of the same things. 
just as those early apostles and the early church, we, we struggle too with our own prejudices. We struggle with change. We struggle with uh, the new things that you want to do in and through us as a church and in, in, as individuals. And so, God, I thank you that we don't have to do that alone. And in fact, you've told us that we have the power to do that because the Holy Spirit lives in and through us. So when we invite Jesus into our heart, he has said, I'm no longer here physically, but I am there in my spirit, and I'm no longer, I'm just with you, but I am in you. Thank you, God, because we need that. We need that empowering. We need that comfort. We need that strength that only comes as you fill us with your spirit. And so, God, I pray that for each of us individually here. I pray that for us as a church, that we will know you, that we will know your spirit, that we will be open to being obedient, and that we'll be open to change. And we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.